managing a group of ICs, individual contributors, is different than managing other managers. For those of you who are planning to transition into that higher level of leadership, or those of you who are already managing managers and you wonder if you are taking all the boxes to do that well, then this episode is for you. Here are the two questions this podcast answers. One, how do you successfully transition into your first official leadership role? And two, how do you keep climbing that leadership ladder and continuously get promoted, although the competition and the expectations get bigger? This show, the Manager Track Podcast, will provide the answers. I'm your host, Ramona Shaw. I'm on a mission to create workplaces where work is seen as a source of contribution, connection, and personal fulfillment. And this transition starts with developing a new generation of leaders who know how to lead so everyone wins and grows. In the show, you'll learn how to think, communicate, and act as a confident and competent leader you know you can be. Welcome to this episode of the Manager Track Podcast. In our one-on-one coaching practice, our executive coaching services, we support many leaders who are operating at the director, or VP level, or the C-suite. And of course, what most of them have in common is that they are managing other managers, or sometimes you know, there are a few layers into management, so they're managing managers of managers. And whenever you are sort of leveling up to a higher level of leadership, there are a few things that need to change. And today I specifically want to talk about what to pay attention to and sort of the common pitfalls that we see when people manage other managers versus managing a group of ICs. So I'm going to share seven specific areas or suggestions on how to manage managers well. I'm going to go through each of them and then, as usual, I'll recap them at the end so that you can keep up and take notes or really identify what are some of the action items that you're taking away from this episode. I want to make this brief, concise and very practical for you. One thing that I say up front in terms of the mindset shift that needs to happen moving into that management layer where you manage other managers. At that level, if not even earlier, it's becoming more and more important for you to see your primary team as your peers, not your group of direct reports. The reason being is that at the level of where you manage other managers, the other managers of managers, i.e. your peers, are now stakeholders of yours and a lot of the work and the cross-functional work that you're now overseeing and that's high stake or high visibility is now dependent on you having really strong relationships with your peers and setting the tone, setting the strategy and setting the direction. And that happens not by you talking to your direct reports or skip levels, but the majority of that work happens among that leadership group that you're now in. And so while you're sort of on two teams simultaneously, you're on the team where uh, it's your peers and your manager, that's one team. And then you, of course, have your team that you're leading. Either you're looking at it as sort of the whole group, the whole department that's under your supervision, or you're looking at it as you and your direct reports. Either way, so if there's two groups, there are two teams that you're part of. So mentally, what I suggest is that you start to ask yourself, how would I operate differently or how would I see my role differently if my primary team is now me and my peers and my boss? My secondary team is me and my direct reports. That again, to go back to the mindset shifts, this is something really important to consider and to start looking at, huh, how am I maybe a little bit too much involved in the weeds with my team and I'm not focused enough on building those cross-departmental relationships that are becoming increasingly important as you elevate. Many people miss that inflection point and they stay too focused with the team. And as a result of that, they're not well connected, they're not driving strategy enough, they're not involved in that on that strategic level sufficiently and it's going to make them less effective if not even cost their job so with that in mind and you understanding the importance of focusing on your peer relationships and upwards relationships more so than ever before let's now talk about how to actually manage your managers and dive into these seven suggestions the first one is around setting clear expectations and goals in all our leadership development programs, this is one of those things that we start with at the beginning. 
it's really important for you to establish the expectations that you have for your managers. It's important to do that with your ICs too. But now there's a bigger ripple effect. If your managers don't know what they're doing and what uh, their priorities should be, then neither will your employee. Then neither will their employees. And so you missing out on setting expectations just has a way bigger negative effect and consequence to it than you missing or being unclear and vague in your expectations with one single individual, i.e. one IC that you're working with. So it becomes more important to establish that alignment and clarity. I suggest to start off by ensuring that every manager clearly understands what's the purpose of their role and what's the purpose of their team. Purpose of the role, why were they hired, and purpose of the team, two things. Then in addition to that, get clear on what their responsibilities are. Especially if those managers that you manage are new managers, they may not understand what you're actually expecting and how to prioritize those expectations or responsibilities that they have. Many new managers moving into their first leadership role underestimate how much time it will take and how important it is to their boss that they're managing the performance, the, the output, the deliverables, their team and how little of what's expected has to actually do with the tactical work. So make sure that's very clear. Purpose of the role of the team, responsibilities and priorities. And typically you could have 30 day priorities or 90 day priorities. This is also not a one time effort. This should be something that you do on a regular basis. Another set of expectations or clarity that I suggest that all falls within that first topic here is to help them understand how to best work with you. What are things, how do you like to receive information? What kind of decisions should they be making versus when do you need to be involved? How should they present information to or problems to you? How to set up meetings or when you're available and not available? The list goes on, but what do they need to know about working with you? And then the third point around clarity on expectations is what do you expect of them as leaders? So often, in especially in startups or fast-growing small mid-sized businesses, there are a lot of people who are getting hired in from other companies. And as the company grows, suddenly the discrepancy in leadership styles becomes bigger and bigger. If you are managing other managers, come together as a team and identify what are the three, five, seven, you name it, specific things that you expect all managers to do? As obvious as this may seem to you listening to this podcast, you might say that every manager needs to have weekly or bi-weekly one-on-ones. You might talk about the expectation to solicit feedback or to provide feedback to employees or to establish clear career development plans for every single employee. You might talk about the importance of having in-person gatherings or offsites. You might talk about having a coaching approach, fostering critical thinking. You might talk about to the degree to which you allow flexibility in people's work hours. Whatever that may be, whatever you want to set us, here is how we lead. This is what matters to us. And we want to create some alignment so the team feels that sense of unity in the leadership team that on one hand uh, increases trust, that sense of reliability and clarity on what's expected for everyone else. So for you as the leader or the manager of other managers, it is your job to bring the group together and to identify what are those core expectations that we have specifically for managers in our department or in our group. So that all falls within that first suggestions of providing clarity on expectations. Now, the second one is to provide resources and support. Now you're managing other managers, so do you, what you have in common that you didn't have in common when you were managing just ICs is all of you as a group are responsible for people. And so there are people issues or people challenges, management challenges that you share. Many of the managers that you manage or the chances are high that they're first time managers or they have less experience in managing than you. 
for you to offer support, to share your lessons learned, to act as a coach who's like asking the, the, the important questions, the thought provoking questions about their leadership approach or their leadership challenges, for you to offer guidance where appropriate, as well as be vulnerable about your own growth areas, your own sort of hardships that you've had, because they are going to learn from you, your role modeling, how to lead. And you're all also role modeling that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to share challenges. It's okay to solicit feedback, which hopefully will also encourage them and demonstrate to them that it's okay for them to go and solicit feedback and to share with their team that they're not perfect, that they also have their growth areas. So that was number two, provide resources, training and so forth, of course, but also offer that sense of support, especially on all things management or people related challenges. Then number three is to have regular check-ins. We've already talked about the one-on-one. So you might say with all my managers, I'm going to do bi-weekly or weekly one-on-ones. Another thing that many of our clients really love doing is having office hours and you can set office hours only for your managers so they can bring sort of ad hoc and urgent topics. And they know that every day between one and two o'clock, for example, you have time blocked where you just hang out on a Zoom call and you see if someone wants to come in and ask questions. That would be an office hour, but also have your regular one-on-ones and try to be as consistent with them as possible. If your managers don't know if you're going to reschedule or cancel them, it diminishes the effectiveness of the meeting because then they'll have to reach out to you when and as things happen versus trusting that they can create a list and then bring that list to the meeting if they never quite know if that meeting is going to take place or not. On the note of check-ins, it's also important to do skip level check-ins. Skip level check-ins means that you talk to your manager's direct reports. Don't do that too often. While some people do this on a monthly basis, other people do this on an annual basis, find the right cadence for you on how often you wanna have 30 minute calls, 20 minute calls, or even shorter to have 15 or 15 to 30 minute calls with a selection of skip levels so you can rotate but you can also do all skip levels every so often to ask how they're doing get a bit of a pulse check on how the relationship is with their manager any suggestions or ideas for the department and anything else that they want to share with you or questions that they might have for you that also gives gives you a bit of a pulse on how the org is doing and the health of the org now that you are a level removed from sort of the, the, the maturity of, of employees on, on the team. So that was number three. Now let's move on to number four. Number four is around the topic of accountability. One of the challenges that you might have or the worries that you might have is that your managers tolerate performance issues, their teams too long and don't intervene fast enough to either coach, you know, provide feedback or terminate or redirect an employee into, into a new role. So make it a habit or build it as part of your, what we call the leadership system, part of your regular routines and behaviors to check in with your managers on the, the health of the team, check in on performance issues and what kind of action plans that they set in place with their ICs. Developing a team at high levels of self accountability, i.e. every single employee feels that sense of accountability and knows what is expected of them and does the best to exceed or meet those expectations. That is something that needs to come from the top. For most leaders, it's also one of the most challenging things to sort of institutionalize or roll out and cultivate as they are leveling up. Many managers, newer managers struggle with this. And so for managers who manage managers, this is one of those where you kind of kind of be on it, make it a regular topic. As I said, track with KPIs and ensure the feedback conversations happen and the action plans 
are set up and owned by the employee who might have a performance issue. Also on that note, and sort of the flip side of the coin is to offer recognition and make sure that not only you promote and recognize the employees on that in a bigger team, but also your managers have the practice of recognizing and appreciating, praising employees. It changes the culture and it's one of the most important development tools that you have in your toolkit to provide that kind of uh, positive reinforcement and feedback to the team. It's also very meaningful if an employee receives a positive recognition, not just from their direct manager, but from the manager of the manager. So if they do something well and the manager will give you an update about what they've done and CC the employee, sort of that triangle, that's a very powerful tactic to recognize someone on the team and to show them, hey, I'm an advocate of yours. I'm creating visibility with my boss for what you've done. Or you shouting them out on a Slack channel, Teams channel, or in a team meeting and doing that is also setting the tone that recognition is valued on the team and that you have a pulse on things and you see who are the high performers and those who do really good work. That is on the topic of accountability. Transitioning from being an individual contributor and I see into your first leadership role is one of the biggest transitions that you'll make in your career. Because the things that made you successful as an IC will not be the same things that will make you successful as a leader. And especially in a new role, when all eyes are on you, when you know your boss wants you to succeed and is watching closely, your peers are having an eye on you, your team members are keen to figure out how to work with you and whether or not they can trust you. During this time, by the way, whether or not you're a first time manager or you've led teams in the past, but you're in a new role as a new manager to the team or even to the business. This is a time in which you don't want to wing it. Go into such a situation with a plan and with specific tools that will help you build trust and gain the respect of your coworkers. In our new manager toolkit, we'll give you guides, tools, checklists, and lots of things that are important for any new manager to keep in mind. Head on over to arcova.org slash free dash toolkits to grab your copy. You can also find that link in the show notes or the captions. I'll see you over there. Now I'm going to move to my fifth topic, which is around communication and collaboration. Just like I mentioned, you, have, you need to have strong relationships with your peers. It is also going to be important for your managers to form relationships with their peers inside that you know, your unit, but also with other units or other departments. If they're not already doing that, and that's not already built in, it's important for you as the leader to set that in place. What you can do is you can set up meetings. You can even have like management roundtables where they come together, they learn through and with each other about management or management skills. You can initiate projects where you specifically and intentionally assign a couple people from your team and also from other teams to come together and work on a, a shared goal to start to establish these relationships. Or instead of you going out and talking to people, encourage them to have conversations on their level first and then for them to come together and present something to you. So again, for you to ensure that the collaboration happens, not just at your level, but you're trying to sort of trickle that down and spread that out, will make them more effective and hence your whole unit more effective. Number six is around delegating effectively. And this includes how much you delegate decisions, how much you delegate tasks and work and responsibilities. And it also means to not undermine their authority. So let's start with the decisions. What you may think is someone else's decision, or meaning one of your manager's decision, may not be what your manager thinks. So your manager may have worked at companies where everything had to be rolled up and get approved by their boss. So they'll bring information to you and they're asking you to verify, to give the stamp of approval, when you think that's not necessary. Get really clear with them on what you need to actually be involved in and how much agency they have. Sometimes it's you know up to a do certain dollar amount, you have full authority to make decisions. When it comes to approving time off or expenses, this is all going to be your responsibility. I'm not going to get involved. When it comes to a certain project, 
this is going to be you know your decision you're going to own that decision let them know and also check in on a regular basis like hey would you like to make more decisions do you feel i'm not providing enough support would you like for me to be more involved in certain areas solicit that feedback to see how they're doing not everyone is going to need to be led the same way by you so some of them may want your involvement others may feel like no i'd actually like more and love this autonomy and as long as you can trust them provide that autonomy to them of course the same is true with the tasks and how much you involve yourself now i want to quickly touch on that not undermining authority point this is really important and i see this sadly way too often where a leader wants to be very supportive to their direct reports in this case other managers and they'll i want to ensure that they're set up for success they want to ensure that they feel supported maybe you don't fully trust them yet and so you know you're having their back by being in the meeting or being involved in certain workflows or double checking certain work but all of that actually undermines their authority if your direct report is responsible for a new project and you're now showing up to these project meetings everyone else in the room is looking to you not to your direct report because you're more senior. And so whatever you say is going to ultimately be what they're gonna look at or listen to. And if you have a different opinion than your direct report, you're going to undermine them. So get yourself out of these situations. And if you do go in, make it very clear that you're sort of a fly on the wall and that the person running the show is, you know, your direct report. If you do have feedback or you do disagree with them, it, in most cases, this is not a black and white decision here, but in most cases, it's way better for you to take it offline and behind the scenes, coach your direct report, but let the direct report be the face and be the one communicating out versus the two of you sort of being in the dialogue because you're going to win and you're going to undermine that authority of the manager. It's a sneaky one because oftentimes leaders want to be helpful and they don't recognize that they're actually doing the opposite and it's making it way harder for your manager to establish their uh, authority and gain people's respect. It applies to both the the team that they manage, but also cross-functionally in how they're seen by their coworkers. Now, last but not least, I'm gonna talk about succession planning. Identify on each team, sort of start grooming your leadership bench. When you have a team of ICs. So you are a manager and everyone on your team are individual contributors. If one of your individual contributors leaves and you have to step in to do their job, yeah, you, you know, it's one role, so to speak. It's like one task that you have to manage. Not ideal, but doable. If your manager leaves, if you're managing managers and that manager leaves, you're now, you you have to step in because no one else is there who could take that on. You now have your whole full plate of things, but you're now also responsible for managing that entire team. And many more people and much more of their work is now affected by there being an empty position, a bit of a void present on the team. So it just becomes increasingly important that you start to think about like, what would I do if this person leaves? Who would be able to step into that role? How do I need, we need to develop them? What's the backup plan? And how do we ensure that information, you know, flows and things are documented and someone has the training or has the ability to help out, even if there are always going to be things that land on your plate, you think ahead of, How do you develop leaders in order to build up the bench so that if you move up, you have someone who can step into your role. And if one of those people steps up or you grow and you expand the team or someone leaves, that there is a succession plan. And of course, that means every single person should have sort of a career plan or at least a development plan on what would get them to the next level or what are the specific areas that will help them be more the productive or a higher performing and then for you to provide stretch assignments or to intentionally set up their work 
responsibilities to support them with their growth and also provide them opportunities to expand, opportunities to gain new skills or expertise or build relationships or create some visibility from above. So that is that last component around developing succession plans. I'm going to quickly recap the seven points that we talked about. First, setting clear expectations. Second, we talked about providing resources and training as well as a lot of support for them and being vulnerable. Then we talked about regular check-ins, having a bit of a pulse on things with your skip levels. Next, we talked about promoting accountability, ensuring that you know about performance issues and action plans. Then we talked about communication and collaboration across your unit as well as other uh, units and teams. And then we talked about delegating effectively, ensuring that you're not undermining their authority. And then lastly, we talked about having a succession plan and developing a leadership bench on your team. All that while keeping in mind that as you elevate your cross-departmental relationships become more important, your primary team mentally should now likely be your peers and your boss and your secondary team or your direct reports. Just mentally so that you ensure that you spend enough of your attention and your effort on building those relationships. Um, And with that, I'm going to wrap this episode. I hope you found this practical. You had some new ideas or some areas where you thought, huh, good for me to think about or good for me to prepare about. You maybe took some notes for when you are managing other managers. It's a great way to grow. Um, Most people really notice the difference and how they're up-leveling their skill and they're becoming a lot clearer in their communication and in the way that they spend their time and what they focus on and what they prioritize. So while challenging, it's also a great and really fun place to be. And so that's it for today. I'll see you in the next episode of the Manager Track Podcast. Ciao for now. If you enjoyed this episode, then check out two other awesome resources to help you become a leader people love to work with. This includes a free masterclass on how to successfully lead as a new manager. Check it out at arcova.org forward slash masterclass. The second resource is my best-selling book, The Confident and Competent New Manager, How to Quickly Rise to Success in Your First Leadership Role. Check it out at arcova.org slash books or head on over to Amazon and grab your copy there. You can find all those links in the show notes down below.